Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India is going to be two part lecture. Here we are going to discuss two important schools in the field of history writing in India and these are New Cambridge school which emerged towards the last years of 1960s and then major publications came in 1970s. Followed by this discussion, we will talk about another major intervention. This is known as subaltern studies. These two interventions have made very influential marks on the way questions pertaining Indian nationalism were asked so far in terms of use of archive and sources and also for their perspective of looking at Indian politics and Indian society. So, let us start with Neo Cambridge School. The first important book by which we associate this school of historical scholarship came in 1968. This was written by Anil Seal and the title of the book is Emergence of Nationalism in India competition and collaboration in the latter 19th century. Soon after the publication of this book, he and his colleagues in University of Cambridge and one from University of Oxford they came up with series of publications focusing on different aspects of Indian nationalism. For example, in 1973, John Gallagher, Gordon Johnson and Anil Sill edited Locality, Province and Nation essays on Indian politics 1870 to 1940. A couple of years later, Judith Braun came up with her study on the rise of Gandhi. And the series continued for some time. The freshness of perspective, new kinds of sources and the ways of approaching the subject on all these counts, people immediately took notice of this scholarship. 
In fact, there is a, a background to it. By end of, by mid 1960s, the rules regarding access to archive, archival files, documents were relaxed. Earlier, it was 55 years and now it was relaxed to 33 years. This enabled historians to look for new material to access documents which were hitherto not used or which were not permitted to be used. And the richness of these material gave an appearance of certain robustness, a kind of very rigorous foundation to their argument. Immediately, in terms of the framing of question and in terms of perspectives, arguments, their intervention raised many eyebrows and also invited lot of criticism as well as appreciation. This provocativeness is one of the crucial factors through which historical scholarship has progressed over the centuries. And in this regard, even though in India, particularly the community of historians became quite vociferous in their attack on this school. Nevertheless, this has been an important and influential school of scholarship in as far as history of modern India is concerned. As we often find in common languages, you may love it or you may hate it, but you can't ignore it. The first point that I would like to score while discussing this school is massive use of historical data. And this data, as I was just mentioning, was pertaining to not merely the high politics, but of the center or central leadership involved in Indian national politics, but this was also about provincial leaders or data coming from regional archives. And naturally, this move from the code to provinces, to regions, to localities, provinces was because they shifted their attention from looking at Congress leaders in the center to provincial leadership and down the line. They, instead of focusing on ideology of nationalism, 
they actually argued in the opposition opposite direction. They invested their focus on real political arithmetic of power and authority instead of ideology of nationalism in Indian national movement. The core argument based on this data and this set of perspective was that the leaders in Indian national movement were participating for their own vested interests. This was in many ways a sensational argument at that point of time, because the direct implication of this was a claim that there was no national consciousness, no national ideological commitment in India's freedom struggle against British Empire. Now, let us briefly talk about the intellectual genesis of this scholarship and the roots go back to studies coming from African context by two scholars, John Gallagher and Ronald Robinson, who were working on imperialism in Africa. And they looked at it, they looked at the symbiotic interaction between local groups and anti-colonial nationalist movement there in Africa. They came up with a highly influential article in which they made claim that imperial rule spread in Africa in large part through the collaboration of Africans who found personal and group advantages in sync with the colonial powers. So, this was this framework of looking at politics, Anil Seel and his colleagues borrowed from this study, which was in the context of Africa. The another lineage, which the seal does not acknowledge overtly, go back to a study by Charles Namier, who with respect to 19th and 20th century, another lineage of New York Cambridge School goes back to a study by Charles Namier with regard to 18th century England, where we find a concentration of personal interests and examination of the mess between local interests and national organizations and the sharp discounting of ideological rhetoric and 
its role in shaping politics. The Anil Seal does not overtly mention Namir, but the link is there for any reader to see. The techniques and methods Seal has employed in his exploration have included political sociology, quantification of data, and a careful analysis of actual behavior as against public propaganda. The core argument of seal can be summarized in two main arguments. First, Indian politics was an interconnected system functioning at different levels and British government had directly or indirectly much to do with the linking of those levels. Secondly, imperialism built a system by interlocking its rule in locality, province and nation, where nationalism emerged as a byproduct, as a matching structure of politics, and at each level one has to look at the reasons why different elements were joining into politics. And there, while evaluating the reasons, the motivations which led people to join politics. This school comes up with a model where the credit of expanding the opportunities and this network was accrued to British government itself. And he argues that Indians at the local level sought British support for their own interests at local level. Frequently, competing factions in the levels of village, district, or province sought connections with the British to score brownie points over their opposition. Immediate revances were quite often mundane and even petty. These reflected local problem, problems and conflict of power rather than any grand 
opposition to British rule in India. In that scheme, just as the British had their network and linkages, Indians also developed a parallel network and linkages to advance their own concerns. The search for allies vertically as well as horizontally led to the formation of national political organization. So, this is the, the core of new Cambridge school, where the politics is an arena of acquiring material gains, a play field of vested interest rather than any national commitment. And in this vicious real political scenario landscape, where they left no space for any kind of emotional attachment to nation and national cause. These historians often went on to term provincial leaders as contractors and subcontractors of Congress's central leadership. For example, Judith Braun in her study on the rise of Gandhi has summarily ignored ideological inspirations which Gandhi had provided and instead in her book Gandhi emerges as an extremely able real political strategist whose power relied on his subcontractors. Subcontractors, contractors are the terms quite often used. <laughs> Compared to these provocative and narrow understanding of politics. Another member, Christopher Bailey, comes up with somewhat reasonable propositions. He looked at Allahabad and his book is titled Local Roots of Indian Politics. Here he looked at the linkages between political arena and religious arena, where we come across traditional value systems, particularly coming from mercantile landscapes, mercantile families played crucial role in shaping the politics of Allahabad. 
later on Bailey further developed the argument by moving away from narrow understanding of real political landscape to a much more amorphous territory where economic history, social history and political history all three come together in quite insightful manner. We are particularly talking about his study called Rulers, Townsmen and Bazaar. Sorry. Bailey in his book titled Rulers, Townsmen and Bazaars in North India has looked at 18th century and early parts of 19th century to argue and passed his attention at three levels. This is about the relationship between rulers, commerce and markets in North India. At second level, he looks at social history of towns and at third level he looks at North Indian merchant family and trading institutions from family histories. This time period which he chose to focus upon 18th century had acquired certain attention in preceding decades. In the dominant framework, the century was considered as a dark century, Mughal period had already come to an end, though not strictly legally speaking, but with the demise of Aurangzeb in 1707, the disintegration had started and British imperialism had not yet taken the control. So, this in between phase was a matter of lot of debates and the prevalent argument was the economy was in its worst shape due to the decline of mighty Mughals. Bailey in this book has very convincingly shown that the Mughal empire had declined and now there was no central anchorage 
to Indian economy, but with the emergence of different states, be it in Abad or Hyderabad, to name just two, just a couple of them. Bailey argues that the volume of economy had actually grown and now instead of economics, economies centralized activities, we come across decentralized economic activities. And in this scenario, small towns and their merchant class played extremely crucial role in shaping both the political structure of time to come as well as the social fabric in India. However, unlike Bailey, other framework advanced by New Cambridge School did not last very long, though in the decades of 1970s and even up to 1980s, we come across many good studies following the same path. <coughs> With this brief discussion on Neo Cambridge scholarship, now let us move to another thought provoking school in history writing which is known as subaltern studies. Now, we are going to discuss subaltern studies and their contribution. This came up initial years of 1980s and from the very first line of journal which this collective came up with, we come across a rejection of entire historical scholarship thus far. Ranajit Guha, who spearheaded this school, writes in the very beginning of introduction to subaltern studies first volume of collected essays and he writes that the historiography of Indian nationalism has for a long time been dominated by elitism, colonial elitism and bourgeois elitism. This historiography he claims 
that so far has failed to acknowledge far less interpreted the contribution made by the people on their own that is independently of the elite to the making and development of this nationalism. These are perhaps one of the most provocative statements as far as historiography on Indian nationalism is concerned. While neo Cambridge scholars had refuted any national consciousness and any ideological commitments in the struggle for Indian independence, now barely a decade later in subaltern studies, we come across that the entire historiography on colonial movement, anti-colonial movement was myopically elitist in nature, which had failed to acknowledge the contribution of made by people. In this sense, it is almost 100 degree change from what neo Cambridge scholars were arguing. Here, for the first time, we come across not merely historians analytical focus moving to participation of people, but this people which these historians termed as subalterns acquired the center stage in the history of national movement. Ranjit Guha argues and these are some of the core postulates of this school. He argues that there is a disjuncture between the politics of the elites and that of masses or the subaltern. There is a parallel domain, parallel to the domain of elite politics, another domain where the principal actors were not the dominant groups of the indigenous society or the colonial authorities, but the subaltern classes and groups constituting the mass of the laboring poor and the immediate or sorry and the intermediate strata in town and country. This was an autonomous domain of politics. This is autonomous, but we must bear in mind that he never claims that this is an isolated or independent domain. He carefully chooses the word autonomous and 
we will see in the course of our discussion why he is doing so and what are the implications of the term autonomous, because a lot of controversy emerged on this particular aspect. So, he argues that this domain of the people of subaltern was an autonomous domain in the manner that this neither originate from elite groups nor is it nor is this dependent upon the elites for its existence. The group, this group subaltern group acts in terms of its own consciousness. This is again another controversial point which he proposes that subaltern groups, subaltern elements acted in terms of its own consciousness. The ideology operative at this level reflected the diversity of its social composition. He then, he and his colleague goes on to argue that popular mobilization in the colonial period was realized in its most comprehensive form in peasant uprisings and not at the high level of politics. The coexistence of these two domains or streams was an index of an historical truth, Ranjit Guha further adds. And this index was not recognized by Indian historians so far. And this is also the failure of the Indian bourgeoisie to speak for the nation. These are some of the bold formulations made by Ranjit Guha and these in a sense are also building blocks, overarching frames of this school of Indian historiography. The emergence of subaltern school can be located in the periods roughly from mid 1970s onwards. However, as I mentioned earlier, the first book came up in 1982, which was edited by Ranjit Guha and what we just came across was from his introductory remarks. But behind the scene, Ranajit Guha along with his colleagues were working on this project from mid 1970s onwards. 
and now in the writings of in the anecdotal reflections of many of these members we are also gradually getting familiar with the process the intellectual anxieties which led to the emergence of this school the term subaltern comes from military language literally meaning subord subordinate and conceptually proponents of this school these historians derived insights from the writings of italian marxist thinker antonio gramsci on the other hand other intellectual strands go in the milieu of 1970s and 1960s this was the period when we come across mao's experiments with peasantry in china even in indian context peasantry had acquired sharp focus in the second half of 1960s we also come across naxalbari movement in bengal which the remained brief and which failed miserably but it had attracted lot of attention from intellectual class this was also a period which in social sciences at global level can be recognized as quite turbulent period quite intellectually quite productive phase turbulent i am not using in negative sense of the term but a period which gave rise to lot of intellectual churning social science took interdisciplinary turn history also at in other universities outside india was collaborating with other disciplinary questions and methods and was getting richer and richer along with interdisciplinary turn in history we also come across literary turn in social sciences when literature was considered an important influential factor in shaping 
knowledge system and by literature I am using, I am referring to its broadest connotation. Actually, it would be proper to say that social science for the first time recognized the significance of engaging with language at every step of language uh, of knowledge production, where it was widely argued that construction of knowledge is integrally mediated through language and hence social scientists, historians across the world started paying attention to language. Slightly earlier from 1950s, mid 1950s in Indian context, we also witness massive investment in village studies and anthropological studies proliferated from 1960s onwards. Now, it was more and more clear that Historians had so far not addressed the dynamics of caste and other social complex realities at the ground. And all these developments taking place in the field of social science, both at non-Indian or both at the global level as well as in the milieu of Indian social science research. They had prepared a ground for subaltern studies to start making fresh kinds of questions and arguments to start adopting a bold posture which they did. And in this intellectual background or milieu, these scholars paid particularly close attention to the discipline of anthropology and anthropological research. We just noticed village studies from mid 1950s onwards and in 1960s they had started pointing towards a closer, closer scrutiny from anthropological perspective if we wish to understand how colonialism influenced Indian society. In this context, 
one particular name which stands out and which occupies quite comfortably both the terrain of both the disciplinary terrain terrains of anthropology as well as history was Bernard Cohn. His research was focused on North India, particularly on Eastern UP. And much before English speaking world of social scientists was familiar with Michel Foucault's concept of intertwined relationship between knowledge and power, or much before Edward Said's Orientalism had started influencing and shaping research questions and perspectives for history research, history writings. Bernard Cohen had pointed his focus on this intertwined zone where knowledge and power both share and shape historical trajectories. He very convincingly argued that modern India could not be studied either historically or culturally without studying the structural and cultural change that colonial rule unleashed in the subcontinent. The colonial state he encouraged us to believe that the colonial state has had extraordinary effect on the basic structures of contemporary Indian life. He looked at issues like semiotics of cloth, idioms through which imperialism demonstrate its authority and the shifting dynamics of social relationship and social structures, the changes which have enriched both anthropology as well as history of modern India. So, this was the ground on which Subaltern studies was building their intellectual arguments. Now, we will discuss individual contributions and their significance. 